Hello. I hope this finds you all well. Um, as Jeff said, I'm Genevieve Behrens. I work for the Higher Education Support Program at the Open Society Foundations, which is a human rights philanthropy uh, funded by Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump's favorite liberal billionaire, George Soros. Um, so I mostly work on supporting projects which aim to increase refugee access to quality higher education, particularly in the Middle East. And some of the most interesting projects I've had the opportunity to work with and to support in the last few years have used digital means to deliver that education. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. I'm going to compress my remarks slightly, um, just so that we're on time. I'm constitutionally allergic to PowerPoint, so I'm not going to do that. So the order of operations for today is I'm going to give you a little pop quiz. I'm going to give you a bit of a sense of the state of the field, take you on a mental field trip, and then give you a few thoughts on moving forward. So I used to teach high school and I missed the power of the pop quiz, so I'm going to do that right now. Uh, if you could turn to the people near you and discuss the following two questions for just 30 seconds or so. One, please don't use your phones. How many people around the world are currently displaced? And two, what percentage have access to higher education? So if you can turn to your neighbor and discuss. You want them again, the questions? So the two questions were, how many people around the world are currently displaced? And two, what percentage of those people have access to higher education? Give it your best guess. I'm not that worried about it. I just want them to talk to each other. Okay, if you can come back to me. Does anyone know the sort of commonly used statistic on the first one? How many people around the world are currently displaced due to conflict or persecution? Anyone? One in ten, says Jeff. I think that's a bit high. Twenty. Twenty. Anyone have a whole number for me? Because I can't do that math that rapidly. So according to the UNHCR in, in 2015, which is the most recent year for which we have statistics, it was 65.3 million people around the world. And the thing you've heard about that is it's more than at any time since World War II. Uh, and what percentage have access to higher education? Any guesses? I said 65.3 million people around the world are displaced. And how many have percent, uh, access to higher ed? Lower. So the, the commonly given statistic is less than 1%. Um, and I'm going to tell you why that's actually a very bad number in a second. So until about five years ago, there were two programs in the world that focused on getting refugees into higher education. Both operated on very traditional scholarship models. So one was the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commission on Refugees, DAFI program, funded by the German government, which offered about 1,000 scholarships per year. The other was offered by World University Services Canada, I'm Canadian. We're very proud of this program. Uh, it was founded in 1978, and it's offered about 1,400 scholarships in total. So that's about 35 per year. So in the world for refugees, up until about five years ago, when something very important happened, there were about 1,035 uh, scholarships available for forcibly displaced people. Do the math, 65 million, 1,035. One, less than 1% is the understatement of the century. So that started to change in the last five years. Why? Syria. Syria started to change that. If I asked you to imagine a refugee, you'd probably imagine someone coming from a country with relatively low enrollment in higher education anyway, right? Until Syria, the two largest producers, countries that produced the largest numbers of refugees were Somalia and Afghanistan. Not exactly known for their, you know, rigorous and, and um, bountiful higher education systems. That changed with Syria. Before the war, it was a middle-income country. About 25% of its uh, re relevant age cohort was enrolled in higher education. So that was about 100,000 young people in higher education at any given time. So now those 100,000 people, uh, as young people, many of them have been displaced. They've ended up in other countries, in the Middle East, in Europe, and they're demanding education. 
Uh, the United Nations Human Rights Council identifies four main barriers that are preventing refugees and asylum seekers from, from receiving education, from enrolling. One is legal. Um, there's a lot of issues, obviously, with their status. There's also issues of paperwork. It turns out when you flee a country because of civil war, you don't necessarily think to grab your transcripts. So you show up at a German university. You say, I was a second-year math student at the University of Damascus. They say, prove it, and you can't. Two, there's obviously a language issue. You're in Germany, you're Syrian, you've gone to school in Arabic your whole life, you maybe don't even speak English, you have, probably don't have the skills to study in German. Three, as with any group of disadvantaged students, there's a financial issue. In Germany, higher education may be free, but throughout much of the rest of the world, it's not. And four, there's a university capacity issue. I heard a wonderful statistic from, well, very depressing statistic from the Germans, which is that if they were to enroll every student refugee student in Germany today who uh, was university ready and interested in enrolling in education, they need to o open two additional mid-sized universities. That's in a country that has an incredibly robust and well-respected higher education system. You can imagine the burden that's being placed on universities in countries like Jordan and Lebanon. So, I'd like to take you on a mental field trip to a program that is using digital education to get around some of these barriers. So if we were to go to the airport, get on a plane, travel to Jordan, we'd land in Amman, we'd take a car uh, 100 kilometers east of Amman to a, a refugee camp called Azraq. Uh, it's on the border with Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. Can't get better neighbors than that. It's in the middle of the desert. There's nothing around. Uh, it's a new camp. They're still accepting new arrivals. Most of the refugees there are Syrians. There's very high security. The Jordanian government is worried about militants. They're worried about ISIS. So once you're in, you can't get out. It's very hard to get in. It takes three months to do it. There's basically no cell phone connectivity. That's a choice that the Jordanian government has made. Um, sorry, yes. That's a choice that the Jordanian government has made to block uh, reception for cell phones in that area. Um, but there's something remarkable happening in that camp. No one has right to work in Jordan as refugees, or very few people do. But in that camp, there's a group of about 20 students that last term took a class at Princeton University. Uh, they took this class um, through Princeton with the help of the University of Geneva, which runs a research center, which has been offering higher education for refugee programs around the world for a few years now. And not only did those students at, uh, in Azraq take this class, but there were also students at Princeton University taking this class for credit. And there were students at Kakuma Camp, which is a refugee camp in, in Kenya, also taking this class. So you had this student body of Americans at one of the most elite universities, and then refugees from Azraq and Kakuma, all together online taking a course. So the course was also offered on edX, so any one of you could also have enrolled in that course and you would have been part of this global community. The, the course, to give you a little bit more information, it was assembled and, and created by a Princeton history professor. Uh, the, the forums and, and the learning platform were moderated by TAs at Princeton. It was implemented by a research group at the University of Geneva, which I mentioned, which has this expertise. Um, and there was an in-person tutor there at the CARE Computer Lab, which is an, an international NGO, to provide support if there were connectivity issues or just basic learning questions that people had. Um, I think that's probably the most truly global learning experience I've ever heard about. I'm a product of an international school education, but I find when I went to my international schools, I often encountered people from sort of the same socioeconomic background and, and similar experiences to me, even if they came from different, ex different countries. And I can only imagine that if you're a student at Princeton taking a course, that having refugees in that course changes the dynamic of how you talk about the subject matter and how you think about it all the more so because the course happened to be a course on the history of global migration. So you're taking a course with refugees on this history, which includes not just the current crisis, but also the World War II and what happened there, and all the way back to American slavery, and thinking about how all of those things fit together and how they impact the current situation. Uh, I think it would cast in a whole new light sort of this learning experience. I'm gonna, I was going to detail another um, example, but I'm going to do it quite quickly because I'm conscious that we're running out of time. Essentially, this is not the only experiment that's going on like this. In Dadaab camp, another refugee camp in Kenya, uh, there's a, a group of universities, two Canadian and two Kenyan, that are offering entire teaching diplomas. Um, it's called Borderless Higher Education for Refugees. I recommend that you look it up if you're interested in learning more. But they're doing that because one of the few jobs open to refugees 
at that camp in Dadaab is teaching. And so you have the graduates from the high schools becoming the teachers at the primary school the very next year. You can imagine what this does for quality. So they're trying to intervene into that process um, and, and actually provide the teachers with not just some remedial education, but a full degree. Um, two important things to note about this. One is that they've done it in a stackable way. So students are earning certificates towards diplomas because they're very aware that these students, many of them may have to move, that they're likely to not be able to continue for the entire four years. They might have to go somewhere else. So at least if they have to go, they have those, those certificates leading towards that diploma as, as recognition of that learning. They faced an interesting challenge in the last year. The Kenyan government has said they're closing down the camp. Somalia, which is where most of the refugees come from, is a relatively safer place than it used to be, and Kenya would like those refugees to return home. And so if this was a brick and mortar university, I don't know what would happen. It would close, right? And there might be some transfer of human capital back to Somalia, but the infrastructure would be left behind. But this is a digital program. And so those four universities have assigned memorandums of understanding with Somali universities, and they're hoping that those students now, once they return to Somalia, will be able to continue in those same programs in Somalia. So I should be very clear here, I can't take credit for either of these programs. I have the pleasure of, of supporting them and working with them, but they're not my programs. If you want to know more about them, they both have websites. Uh, the one in uh, Amman, if, or in Jordan, if you look up InZone at the University of Geneva, you can find more information. And the one in Kenya is called Borderless Higher Education for Refugees, B-H-E-R. And the four universities are the University of British Columbia, my alma mater. Uh, York University, Moy University, and Kenyatta, two Canadian and two Kenyan. So, if we were to return to Malta now, having taken this virtual field trip to Jordan and Kenya, uh, looking forward, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I've learned working with these projects for the last few years. So I'll say right off the bat, digital education is not our salvation. It's not going to solve the problem of education for refugees. None of these programs are scaled up. They're all for dozens, maybe hundreds. There's a few programs that offer digital education to thousands of refugees, but they're not going to solve this problem tomorrow in any substantive way. I'd also say that uh, digital education and vulnerable students are a particularly dangerous combination because the refugee students are often so keen um, to enroll in some sort of higher education program that they're particularly open uh, or likely to be exploited. And there are people that have tried to make money off of this desire. There's also a risk of over-promising and under-delivering because you're working in very difficult conditions where pol politics change rapidly and you can't always respond to that. But nonetheless, this is what I've learned. One, blended is best. Absolutely all of the programs we support have an in-person and online element. The teaching may be done online, but I think for refugee students, that student community, is all the more important. And in fact, they cite it as the thing they miss most often about, about what they left behind in their universities in Syria and elsewhere. So it requires a holistic vision of education and a certain degree of tech support. They often don't have the skills that you would expect maybe a, a, a Maltese undergrad to have to sort of navigate through the learning management system. So they do need someone often with them to provide that in-person support. Two, accreditation matters. A lot of learning for uh, refugees is, is sort of learning for learning's sake, and while that's important and often fills up a lot of sort of empty time when you can't work, no one knows more than a refugee the importance of paperwork, which is why I was particularly excited about Malta's new accreditation framework, because I think it will make it easier for some of these programs to, to get that accreditation and not have to jump through all the hoops they're currently going through to make sure that their own universities will recognize the courses they're offering. Two, a lot of this can be done, or three rather, can be done on existing platforms. There's not a tremendous need to build lear new learning management systems. Some of the most exciting projects I've seen are using Facebook and WhatsApp as their, their main way of interfacing with students because those are, those are systems on which the students already have digital fluency. And so there's a degree of learning that they don't have to do because they already know how to use them. Four, the real value of this is that it shares the burden. Suddenly, you don't need those two new mid-sized German universities because two Canadian universities who maybe don't have any refugees in their, their like, physical community can come in and offer their resources and expertise. Uh, 
all of these projects are these wonderful partnerships of NGOs and universities and coming together. No one has all of the skills. This is a very unusual space. Universities don't work in refugee camps. They don't know how to work in refugee camps. So all of the most successful projects bring together a wide range of stakeholders to make this happen. I think, and Malta can certainly attest to this, the scale of the current refugee crisis requires more than just tweaks to the existing system. It requires a new system at the higher education level as well as, as, well as elsewhere. And digital education offers us opportunities which can alleviate the double tragedy of displacement coupled with educational underachievement. Thank you. We've got time for one or two more questions. The two, two talks are on rather different topics, and I think it's easier if we take questions to Genevieve and then we take the questions to Manuel. So, any questions to Genevieve? Yeah, over there. Brian. To what extent do these online programs try to shape the content to mobile phones, which would often be the main integration not very much. So often, uh, like WhatsApp is being used for homework and additional support, but the actual like learning management system is still designed for a computer and is being used on a computer. That's something I'm very interested in, though, because I think uh, I think they came out with the statistic, the UNHCR, that something like 65% of Syrian refugees had a smartphone. So there's definitely um, opportunities there to, to be exploited. Anyone else? Uh, yes. Down here. Stand up and shout. Come, and shout. we're not sure we've got a mic. So I'll, I'll just use, just use mine. Okay. Um, I find it fascinating what you were saying and about how you, you don't see there's a need for new platforms, but that there, that there is a need to do, thank you, that there is a need to do more than tweak the current system. And um, I, I'm aware I am from from looking at this area that there's some, some really exciting initiatives in the digital and online sector where I'm aware of one area where a group of online universities have um, signed a memorandum of understanding where the credits between the universities can be shared and they're aiming it particularly at, um, at refugees and asylum seekers and particularly asylum seekers because when you don't have status, then your access to education is very dependent on where you, where you happen to be and you may not be stable. Um, but I wondered um, for, while blended is best, if, if there isn't the option, are you seeing good results um, where people are maybe getting mentoring online as well? Mm -hmm. So that maybe they can get mentoring from other students um, or from tutors <coughs> online as well or through Skype or, Skype or WhatsApp? Is, is that an option when there isn't blended? And then also just with regard to, to WhatsApp and Facebook, what sort of results are you seeing in terms of um, assignments, in terms of actually assessment? Because I find the area fascinating, um, but I, I'm just not sure how it works. Um. Okay, so your first question was about uh, Skype. Yes, so there are some programs. I would say the mentoring piece, people are just starting to play with in a serious way. Um, and I think there's an issue of sort of accountability and making sure that the pe person on the other side of the phone actually picks up their phone they, or picks up the Skype call, which you don't necessarily have if you're sitting all in one place. Um, but by blended, I even mean just having facilities, libraries, um, to return to Philip Schmidt's point of yesterday, open. Um, it doesn't need to be, you know, a purpose-built anything. It just needs to have an aspect of community, I think, built into it. Um, on the other one, I don't, the, I can, I'm happy to connect you with the project in, it's a project in Iraq, in Iraqi Kurdistan, that was using Facebook, and the WhatsApp um, was in Jordan as well at a different camp. Um, I know with the WhatsApp, they were sending out homework assignments and then having students respond to a WhatsApp group. I don't think that was their official assessment, though. I think it was sort of supplementary learning. Um, I think a lot of sort of the official uh, final assessment is still being done in relatively traditional ways, especially to connect to the accreditation issue. So, for example, in Dadaab, um, after the Garissa massacre, which is when Al-Shabaab went into a local university and killed 100 and something people, 
the national exam were supposed to happen right then, and they had to do them under ar like an armed convoy, essentially, because in order to be accredited through the University of Geneva, they had to have proctored exams, um, and it just happened to be very bad timing. Okay. So that's still uh, a piece that needs working on. Great. Okay. Right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.